boat drafted by the NHL. And were there two Hall of Famers drafted after you? Yeah, Luke Robitaille and Brett Hull. I remind them every chance I see them. That's great. <laughs> that's, that's funny. Um, so when you're drafted by the NHL, how much consideration is there really to going down that route? Uh, um, I mean, it wasn't without consideration, but it was more... It was more if I was going to play, if I was going to play hockey, if that was what I wanted to do, I was going to go to college. Okay. Um, you know, because hockey's different than baseball in that when they draft you, they have your rights for five years. You know, baseball, you'd get drafted as a high school player. You got to sign before school starts or they lose you. Right. So there's much more of an urgency, obviously, for me as a second round pick uh, with the Braves. In hockey, it was essentially, I got a call. They drafted me. They know, you know, we know where you're going to school. We'll talk after your junior year. Um, and that was it. So it really became a, um, an exercise, so to speak, of, you know, Braves, college. Do I want to take a chance on baseball or do I want to go to college, try and do that, go that route? And eventually, obviously, the Braves got to the point where, they made it worth my while to take a chance on baseball. How does that help in the negotiation? Um, it helps and it hurts. I think it, I, I think it hurt in my draft. Okay. Because I was told that I I would have been a first round pick, but teams were worried about my signability, and they were worried about it because of hockey. They thought I wanted to play hockey and go to go to school, and play hockey. Um, as far as the, the the negotiations for my contract, it helped. I mean, I think back in those days, I ended up having a sign signing bonus that was equivalent of a late first round pick, so it worked out. Any when you look back, do you because it's the minor leagues and I don't know what you were playing in front of high school, but most minor league games you're playing in front of nobody. Mm -hmm. Middle of the day you're playing in front of nobody. You go from being big fish, small pond to I don't even know what the pond is <laughs> when you're trying to get your legs under you in the minor leagues. How was that adjustment from being away from your family? You're 18 years old. Uh, you're not playing in front of anybody. Nobody's telling you you're wonderful every day. That's for damn sure. Right. And then you have to wait if you don't have a good one because of the position. You've got to wait another five days or four days to go get it done again. Yeah, you know, it was it was a little bit of a culture shock when I signed and started because when I when I signed, I went to Bradenton, Florida, which is where the Braves had their, um, I guess, the equivalent now of like extended spring training, uh -huh. um, and where all the all the draft picks went, and we went we played in the Gulf Coast League, I think it was called. Um, so I'd never been away from home. So I get down to Pirate City, and it didn't take me long to realize that when I got there, I was a minority. It was, it was all, mostly, that's where all the young Latin American kids went. So there was a handful of us American kids there. So right off the bat, I was kind of like, what am I doing here? What's going on? It's a little bit of a culture shock. You know, it's in Florida, so it's a 1,000 degrees, which, you know, yeah. didn't get that way in Boston very much. So, you know, there were a lot of, a lot of, changes walked into my room and lo and behold my roommate was Mark Lemke so he and I ended up having a pretty good journey together all the way up here to the big leagues but the playing aspect of it became a really big adjustment because up until that point in time I was never a pitcher only so when I, you know, when I played ball in high school, if right. I pitched, the next game I played first base or I played center field, depending on which of our other guys was pitching. So you had, if it wasn't a great outing, I got three more games, yeah. four more games to go play, then I'll go pitch again. Yeah. Now, if I had a bad outing, I got to sit here and think about it until yeah. I get to go back out there. So that part was an adjustment, um, really, that whole first year. And then... Um, you know, once you start getting into the affiliate, the affiliate teams, for me, my first full year was Sumter, A-Ball. You know, you, you'll have, much like the big leagues, to a certain extent, you'll have certain nights where you have big crowds. Yeah. You know, if they're giving something away or it's the 4th of July or, or stuff like that, you'll have some big crowds. So those were always fun. But, you know, those were those years were more 
It was the dynamic of the small town that you were in. Yeah. You know, the communities really tried to engage and, and embrace the teams and the players and get the, you know, the small town involved. So um, it was it was a neat experience. But again, coming from the northeast, being in, you know, Sumter, South Carolina that first year, that pretty small town was a little bit of a culture shock. How many games on average did you play? Like, what was your high school schedule? Because that's the other thing when – especially now, and I don't know if anybody has kids who play travel ball, but there are there are 12- and 13-year-olds that are playing 100 games. When you're from, I'm from Jersey, up there, we played 23 games, mm -hmm. and you were having to get 23 games in. Yeah. So you were a little bit nervous about, will they find me, I'm sure, yeah. at some well, point. Well, that, that's too. what, you know, people, it's funny, and I'll get to the point in a minute, but uh, it was always funny to me because I would, I would when, when cell phones first came out, I would call some of my friends on the way to the ballpark and just to catch up and kind of use my time while I'm driving. And, and I always said the one friend would ask me, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to work. And he would laugh at me. And I'm like, listen, anything, anything you do for this amount of time is a job. Now, I like my job and, and, and I like it more than most people do. But don't kid yourself. It's a job. Right. And I said, here's the difference. I do this every single day for nine months out of the year. So when I get to the ballpark and there's a rain out, I'm happy. <laughs> and Little League, I cried. So <laughs> that's the difference, yeah. right? And that's the way it was for, for me, to your point, up north. I, growing up as a kid, I played 20 Little League games a year, it, weather permitting. Mm -hmm. And then usually there was some kind of all-star something that maybe lasted a week or two. And that was it. High school, I played 20 high school games, right. and then the and then the state tournament. However long that lasted, I played American Legion ball. I think my sophomore and junior year of high school, that was another 20 games. So I I never played more than 40 games in a in a summer as a kid. They find you if you can play, but the version of you in 1984. Four? Yep. How would that play now if scouts came to see you? Um, I don't know. I think it would play simply because I was lefty, but I didn't, by today's standards, I I certainly didn't throw hard. Yeah. Um, you know, I think left, being a lefty, it has obviously always has some, some playability, but um, I, was, I was a very raw pitcher in high school. I look at... Like I look at my mechanics in high school and when I and what they were when when my career got ended, it was nowhere close. Like I have people people ask me all the time, you know, especially today about their kids and taking pitching lessons and hitting lessons and this and that. And you know, when did you start taking pitching lessons? And my answer was my my first pitching lesson was the day I showed up as a pro player in, in Bradenton, Florida. I had never, nobody had ever told me anything Did about pitching. Did you mimic, though, what you saw on TV? Was there a picture? No, the only thing I, the only advice I ever got was from my dad. And it was, it was two things. It always told me if I wasn't throwing strikes, bend your back, follow through, which, you know, everybody says that, right? It's like, you hit a bad shot in golf, keep your head down. Well, <laughs> has probably has something to do with my swing well before yeah. that, right? So... But then the other thing he told me was, like, and he said, he said, I don't know anything about pitching, but I, I love Warren Spahn, and I heard him say this one day, that when he's pitching, if he's missing on the outside corner to right-handed hitters, he just moves over on the mound. And I was like, okay. So I started doing that. I started, I would start in the middle of the mound, and if it, I was missing away because the ball was running, I'd just keep moving over until I found a spot where it, I could get it over the plate. And then eventually that's where I ended up when I got to the big leagues. 305 wins later. Yeah, but my mechanics were terrible, honestly. When I showed up in Bradenton and started throwing, the pitching coach was kind of like, oh, my God. I mean, this, <laughs> this is the second rounder. <laughs> so let me ask you, how long, first of all, did you ever make uh, the, the infamous phone call from the payphone somewhere saying, if not, I want to come home, I need to come home. Did you have one of those where you needed someone to talk to you down a little bit um not so much i mean but it's funny though that was the routine right um and how different it is now i would pitch and then i would i would wait in line at bradenton 
Pirate City for the for the payphone, <laughs> so I could get on the phone and talk to my parents for 20 minutes and let, and kind of go blow by blow as to what happened in my outing. Quarters in your pocket. Quarters in my pocket. Yeah. Yep. And that was and that was or sometimes you could you could call collect and they might accept the charges. Maybe. Yeah. Had your, maybe. Had your pitch. <laughs> First, to ask them how he pitches. We'll decide yeah. if you want to. Um, so and that honestly it was kind of cool because that became the routine. Yeah. You know, even when I was in the big leagues, uh, that was my ride home after the game every nice. night was the phone call to my parents. Uh, to talk talk about the game, which you know they watch on TBS anyway, um, but it was usually going over the game or cathartic. Or my mother would be Thomas. I saw some bad words tonight. <laughs> Sorry, mom. That boom mic. <laughs> it was part of those games. The, the TBS boom mic <laughs> yeah. would sometimes pick it up. No. Did you? How quickly did you compare your arm or your stuff to other guys? Because I'd imagine. Do you go through that quick? Like, how many of me are there here? Um, I don't, you know, honestly, I don't know that I did. Um, I mean, I knew there were guys around me, obviously, that that threw harder than me. But, I, you know, I think the, the one thing that I kind of always held in my pocket was I was a higher draft pick. You know, I, so most of the guys that I was pitching with, mm -hmm. I was a higher draft pick than them. So I think that kind of was always my fallback position, so to speak. But are you targeted? Like with Chipper, Chipper was a 1-1. He was the first overall pick. I think he said he got hit 19 times huh. because yeah. everybody wants a notch on their belt. Sure. And I'm not intimidated by the guy who's the 1-1. When you're the higher draft pick, do you feel like while you, you're you probably going to get more leeway in the organization, yeah. there's a little bit of a bullseye on you because everybody wants to take hot shot boy deep? Well, well maybe. Maybe from other teams, maybe. I don't, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how small the world was back then. Okay. You know, like mm -hmm. in today's world, it, it's small. Like there's so many guys that, you know, even for me now as a parent, I've watched my son Peyton play with, played with at Auburn or played against as a kid. Mm -hmm. You know, the kid playing shortstop for the Nationals was his second baseman in high school up here at Blessed Trinity. So it's, it's, a, it's a really small world okay. now in that sense. So I don't know how small the world was back then. You were aware of... You know, I, I remember my first instructional league, similar situation. I, I was facing uh, Corey Snyder, who was 1-1, yeah. I think, in our draft. Um, so, you know, you know those guys, and, and you're immediately there's that sense of, all right, let me find out how good you are, you know, that kind of thing. But I think within the organization, you know, people knew who the, who the high draft picks were. You knew there was a level of, like, at least I knew, not not – to the point of being cocky about it or being lazy about it, but I knew that obviously as a second round pick, I was going to be given every chance right. to fail, right? I never had to go through that because I was always having success at the minor league level that warranted my move to the next level. Um, but, you know, there's, I'm, I'm sure there's some animosity, like, oh, a high draft pick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't think that comes into play so much if you're doing well. Are you conscious of what car? You buy because that's the other thing in the parking lot. Don't people 100%. know? Hundred percent. Yeah. 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 And did you uh, douche? Did you? Did you? Did you ever make the purchase? Oh, of course I did. Yeah. I was uh, very much against my my parents' better judgment, and <laughs> you know, looking back at it, it was a stupid purchase. But back in those days, the IROC Z28, baby, it was <laughs> it was badass. But in the parking lot, though, like but I'll tell you, yeah, in the parking lot. But I'll yeah. tell you, what, it was not very good at all in terms of packing all your gear right. for a season. Right, no. So that was, yeah. the that was where I... That's, the T-Tops needed their own That's room. where I learned that's how to wrong. pack, I can tell you that. But apparently other people coveted my car as much as I did because it got stolen twice. Oh. Once, one time I was in instructional league in West Palm Beach... <laughs> And I was it was an off day. It was a Sunday, so we didn't we weren't going to the ballpark. I get a phone call early in the morning, and it's my mom, and she's like, "Where are you?" I said, "Well, I'm in the hotel. You called me at the hotel." She's like, "Okay." She's, "Where's your car?" I said, "It's right outside." She said, "Well, you better go look." So sure enough, I got up and looked, and I was like, "Oh." She's like, "Yeah, the police called me. They oh. found it." And oh. I was like, "Oh, great!" And you weren't in it. <laughs> I was. <laughs> it I was not in it, yeah. thankfully. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was. Uh, that was at that point in time. I was like, you know what? I probably need to get something a little bit more practical. Yeah. So one of the great stories in in all of the game is the call up story. Um, and I mentioned 305 wins, Hall of Fame, World Series MVP. We'll talk about the first year, how it wasn't necessarily. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't arrow up. No. 
to what the career turned out to be. But what's the call-up story? So I was, uh, it was funny, it was completely unexpected. Um, and, and I think that's a dynamic in the minor leagues that you, you have to, you have to find a way to deal with in your own mind, right? Because particularly when you get to, in my day, when you get to triple A, triple A, right. you're there, right? More and more guys today jump from double A. So it's, it's not as, uh, it's not as defined a path, mm-hmm. so to speak. Um, but when you get to triple A, it's all right, I'm knocking on the door and it could be any, any time now. Right. So I went through a stretch where right before I got called up where I was, I was dealing, I mean, I was pitching as good as I can pitch. I had a, a number of complete games. I had a one or two shutouts. I mean, I've been pitching really well. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Back in my mind, I'm thinking, well, maybe, you know, whatever. So each night it goes, goes by and you make your next start. Well, I pitched in Toledo and I got beat. I think I lost two to nothing or one to nothing or something like that. So, of course, after you lose, right. you know, that, that's all you – like, you don't – at that stage of the game, I, I hadn't learned how to evaluate myself other than did I win or did I lose. Right. That everything was defined by that. They're not going to like me today. Right, because yeah. I lost. Right, Not realizing they don't care about that. Right. So I went back to the hotel. I was you know, bummed out that I lost the game, whatever, and I get the phone call from Roy Matika, who was my AAA manager. He said, hey, the Braves made a trade. Uh, you're going to the big leagues. You're going to start in Houston in a couple of days so you know you're going to meet the team in Houston I was like you know so immediately it's go down the list of phone calls yeah. mom and dad sisters brother everybody um, so yeah I mean it's just one of those moments where it's hard to it's hard to fathom because it's all about a dreams coming true like oh my god I'm going to get that chance but then you still have to go do the work then you still have to go do the work and I was completely naive again I got to the big leagues and it was the Negro uh, not Negro the Doyle Alexander for John Smoltz trade yep Um, so I'm in the big leagues we're in Houston and the Braves are I don't know 10 games back at that stage of the game and I'm thinking you we still got a chance here we can still catch these guys right (laughs) no chance right to be young not realizing that that was the whole white flag and we're rebuilding and that's right. why we traded Doyle Alexander. So it's, you know, it's all those steps that you learn. And, you know, I was in Houston and the Astrodome was still, even today, if I walked in there, like nothing else I've ever seen. It was just a crazy, crazy ballpark and architectural craziness, but um, it was loud, man, because they were in the thick of it when I got there and it was loud and it was the first time I'd ever really been on the mound where you can't hardly hear yourself think you can't hear you can't hear your teammates communicating with you and you know it was really that the end of that year so that was august this time august matter of fact today is my anniversary i think of my big league start so yeah my first big league start i don't know i don't i i shudder to think how many years ago that was now but um 87 87 yeah yeah. so it was a minute um but the rest of that year and then even a into the part of the next year there was still that surrealness about it like you get a little bit more used to doing it but then inevitably you'd get out in the mound and somebody would come in the batter's box and it's like oh my god i've seen that guy facing this guy he's been on my tv (laughs) yeah so he's good it takes time to to get over all that you back when pitchers hit um when you walked up to home plate was it was there a cursory you know, catcher, hey, welcome to the bigs? Or I don't any- I don't remember that, no. Um, I know as time went on, there was always a, hey, you know, say hello to each other when right. you come up Congratulations. here. Congratulations. But, but that was one of the moments, too, that I realized I was in the big leagues because my, my first game, you know, Glenn Davis comes up to yeah. hit and Billy Hatcher comes up and all these guys that I knew and I've been watching on TV and you're like, oh, my God, what am I doing here? And then my first at bat against Mike Scott. <laughs> I got in the box, and that first fastball came in there, and it made a sound like, it's like, oh, I didn't hear that in the minor leagues. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't so, think I have one of those myself. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, it was a little different. Um, what was the bigger adjustment, on field or off field? Because you've been successful. Tell everybody what your record was one and two months into your career. Oh, my God. I, well, my first my first year, which would have been a, yeah. this, this partial year, I th- was I two and five, I think. And then the next, my first full year in the big leagues, I was seven and 17. 
So everything about that said I was going to the Hall of Fame. Right, right. right. I mean, Arrow up. Yeah, I mean, Trajectory. just choo, here we go. But, um, you know, it's funny. I just did, I did an interview earlier this morning. We talked about this, and that's who reminded me of it was my anniversary, which I yeah. forgot. Um, but I, I, I say this jokingly, but I, but I believe it, too. Mm-hmm. When I went through that year of losing 17 games, you know, you, you try to find – you try to find the positives, and I think that's where I started to learn to evaluate myself beyond winning and losing. Um, and, and I knew that the Braves, being where we were as a team, it was more about me developing as a pitcher and getting better every time I went out versus going out there and winning games. Because, I mean, let's face it, we lost 103 games that year, I think. So what's the likelihood that I'm going to win a bunch of games, right? Um, so I learned how to do that. But in the process of going through it, I, I, it truly entered my mind that I was like, you know, if the Braves are keep running me out there to keep losing all these games, there's got to be something they see in me. So there's got to be something good going on, you know. And and I think did you me, figure that out, or did somebody tell you that? No, I figured it out. Okay. I think I, I truly believe, you know, because look, there was a time where. I early in that year where I was looking over my shoulder all the time, like I'm getting sent down. I'm getting sent down. And somewhere I forget where it was, maybe in May. I forget the exact timing of it, but Russ Nixon took over. Um, and we were in Chicago, and I remember he called me in his office, and he said, listen, stop worrying about going down. He said, if nothing else, we have nobody in the minor leagues that's any better than you, so you're getting the ball every fifth day, so figure it out. Again, very Hall of fame Right. Very Hall of fame And I was like, okay. <laughs> and, and it helped. Yeah. You know, well, it had to. It has to. So, you know, at that stage of the game, then it became about – pitching better every time I went out and and that's where you know to your point earlier I think you asked about talking to people and support system that's where my my family was huge especially my mom and dad they were so good you know especially my dad because he was a good athlete so he you know he was good at talking me through the bigger picture and seeing things and and whatever so um but yeah i mean i mean i learned it's you know people ask me too well would you have been better off spending another year in triple a and my answer is always emphatically no because I learned more that year in the big leagues losing 17 games right. than I would have ever learned right. at AAA having a good year. And I learned more about how to pitch, but probably just as importantly as I learned a lot about myself and I learned how to deal with it. And I learned how to deal with not having success. Yeah. You know, not that you want to get used to it, but it's a part of the game. You're going to have failures, you know, and, it, and it's it's inevitable that it's going to happen and it's how you react to it and deal with it and, and it's funny because even now where the game has changed so much in the terms of analytics and in and how that's permeated into scouting you know a lot of these guys are, are getting drafted on analytics and numbers and and then the guys who are in scouting departments and have played the game and understand it you know that's always their first question well how's this dude going to deal with failure right because he's going to have because he's going to have it you know, and I think that's a that's a really hard thing to evaluate wow. if you're not putting your eyes on people. I and you can eat your way out, you can drink your way out, uh-huh. you can be out late your way out. So if you're in your own head with one more thing, with there's no success or there's not enough success, you probably watch guys. They wash out. Oh yeah, they, they can't handle. No, they can't handle it. And and, and conversely, I saw a lot of guys who success their way out, you know, because a lot of guys, a lot of guys get complacent and lazy when they're successful. Right. And then it's, it's funny how I, I would watch guys and, and I, and I, I promised myself I was never, never going to be that guy, but I would watch guys who, when they were going good, they didn't do anything. And then the minute they started a bad stretch, oh, my God, I'm in the weight room. I'm the hardest working guy on the team right now because it ain't going good. Right. And I just promised myself I was never going to be that guy. And um, is that I, your personality on the mound? Because I don't know if, if you guys watch, Tommy, you couldn't tell up five, down five. So is that also part of the don't let them know? Um, that don't was, show it. you know, where that mostly came from was one of my pitching coaches in the minor leagues, Mud, Mudcat Grant. Yeah. He told me two things that I that for some reason and, and it's you know like we were talking about earlier out there on the radio because it happens with me and my own kids. You can have people tell you something all day long, but then all of a sudden somebody tells you something and for some reason it clicks and you remember it. 
for some reason, he told me two things that I remembered. It was first thing was when you go out to the mound, that's your office. So clean it up. So every time I went out there, I'd fill in the holes, I'd sweep off the rubber, and I'd have it nice and clean and ready to go. Uh So that was first. And then the second thing was, he said, when you're out here on this mound, act like you know what you're doing, even if you don't know what you're doing on a given day. Because he said, that team over there in that other dugout wants to kick your ass. And if you're giving them more reasons to think they got you, then they got you. Yeah, blood. So act like if if you throw a pitch to the backstop, Act like you meant to do that. That's, okay. <laughs> and, and the infamous fake it till you make it, because at yeah. a certain point, if yeah. it becomes your personality, I thought it served you perfectly. It served me so good, especially given my tendencies where if I was going to have a bad <laughs> inning, it was usually early. Yeah. So, you know, if I could mentally, emotionally get through that bad first inning, then, you know, I was on my way. And I think the way I went about that and the way the other teams saw that and knew it, I think it, it went a long way to All helping right. me. Was anybody here in 1991 in Atlanta? Anybody here? Oh, let's get to the good stuff. All right. Uh, you figure out losing 17 games is not a great not way a, to go not, about it. Not yeah. a good plan, though. And the team is getting better, and there's an influx of guys who've won a little bit. So 1991, you talked about Houston being loud for the first time. Can you explain what it was like to be in the middle of 91, worst to first, but being played out with it? Quite honestly, for the first time in a long time, asses and seats yeah. and loud yeah. and wanting something that the city hadn't had. Yeah, the only the only bad thing about that year was the ending. You know, and unfortunately it was a storybook year, but Minnesota had the same year and they got the right ending. Right. We did not. Um it was unbelievable, you know, because again for me Around that time is when I started doing the player rep stuff. Yeah. And I know a lot of people don't remember this, but baseball was talking about contracting. And Atlanta was one of the teams they were talking about taking away because things were not good here. I mean, it just wasn't going well. So to go from that to what it was and now what it has become is, for me personally, such a cool story. So it was cool because, you know, we, we knew... We knew we were going to be a better team that year because we got Terry, we got yep. Rafi, we got Sid. Um, you know, all of us pitchers were more experienced. We had a really good second half of 1990. Bobby had laid the messaging yes. down as to what we are, yeah. what we're not. Our pitching staff, I think we improved our ERA almost two runs over the course of the second half of the year. So, and and you could look around, you saw mm-hmm. the nucleus. I mean, we all played together in the minor leagues, you know, so you got me, you got um, Pete Smith, you got um, Smoltzy, uh, you know, you got Justice, you got Ronnie Gant, you know, we, we got guys that we had come through the minor leagues with uh that we all so we knew we had a good nucleus Mm -hmm. but we thought we were realistically a year away Mm -hmm. but we knew we were going to be better we knew we were going to compete um but for anybody to say in that locker room that yeah i knew we were going to win they're lying we we did not we 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 knew we were going to be a better team which even that it wasn't saying much because we lost 100 games a year before (laughs) so you know it, it was uh it wasn't a big leap to be better so to speak but you know, we, we started out and we played well. And I remember I got a phone call at my house. I want to say it was late May from the PR guy. I forget who it was. It might have been Jim, uh, might have been Jim Schultz mm-hmm. maybe at the time. And it was, hey, we're in first place for the first time. In, and I was like, okay. You know, so, but like. But that was a big deal. It here. was a big deal, right? Yeah. And then, you know, we kind of puttered a little bit there going i think we i forget we lost a bunch of games going into the all-star break um and and i think went from like a game or two back to like nine games back or something like that back in the old days of the west yes by the way you're playing in the west yep and i remember we came out of the break and that was bobby's speech when we came out of the break was fellas Got the second half of the year. There's a whole lot of baseball left. We're one good week away from getting back in this thing. And I'll be damned. I think we went out one seven in a row, and the Dodgers lost seven, six out of seven or seven in a row. And it was like that. We were a game or two back. Did you guys realize that you were a story in 91 when people are showing up in the building? The chop starts to happen. You guys become, for the first time, really. We did. I mean, I think we, you know, we, it, it was more, I think, internally, once we got back in it, 
we knew we in that room we knew we were a story so mm-hmm. to speak for our, just for ourselves not nationally yeah. or anything like that we knew all right we got a chance you know we started to believe in ourselves and then you kind of started to see more of a groundswell of people in the seats mm-hmm. the chop really took over you know, people were getting into it. You know, I'd be driving down the down 285 or 75 to the ballpark, and somebody would see you recognizing the car, and they're rolling down the window, <laughs> doing you know, doing the chop at 80 miles an hour on the highway, and it's like this is crazy, you know. But it was so fun to watch it. Um, and then, you know, obviously we we knew nationally we had become yeah. a story, and and you know we were something to we were a force to to deal with, so to speak. We can't do it all, but. I, I am on record. That Minnesota Braves World Series, I think, is the greatest World Series ever. I think the reason it's not looked at it is because the name's on the front. It, I agree. It, it was, you, you do. I agree. I think it's one of the best all time. No yeah. question about it. I mean, and I just think like, that because it wasn't New York or Boston or Chicago right. or Dodgers. No, 100%. And I, I think, think for me, one of the other ones, for me, from my childhood, was the Red Sox in Cincinnati. 75. Um, that would certainly be on the list. But, you know, I mean, again – Think of how times could be different if we had instant replay back then. I know. I think we win that World Series because Ronnie got pushed off first base. But pushed off. Yeah. You, well, you, 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 you got, got body a slam. Yeah. You got a bunch of things <laughs> off. So Ken Herbeck, if you don't know the play, it's still on YouTube. It's an incredible watch. I I talked to Herbeck. I said, you know, if you come through the state of Georgia, don't get stopped by a trooper. You're yeah. getting out of here. <laughs> like even to this day, they they're gonna see your name in that license, and you might not get a fair yeah, shake in front not. of the judge. You may not. Um, but. Do you think there's another story? Does everybody know the air conditioning story? So the Minnesota Metrodome, they won two World Series, 87 and 91. They didn't lose a game at home. Now, it was a little bit tougher to see because it was was a dome dome and not a lot of dome play. But one of the stories is that uh, Jimmy the engineer or Bobby the air conditioning guy would flip a switch when they were... When they were hitting. When they were up. Yeah. Do you believe that to be true? Because Terry Pendleton swears to me he heard it. Yeah. I don't I don't believe it to not be true. <laughs> um, I don't know how often they did it, if it was like um, like clockwork. Mm-hmm. But there were there were like put it this way, there'd be times where and, and I and I didn't pay attention to it enough at the time. Yeah. But there'd be times where you absolutely would look up and the flags would be dead still and then you look back up and it and they're in a dome. In a dome. Yeah. So there was there was definitely something to it. I mean, I've heard the story, and I said to Pendleton one day, and, and he said, no, 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 it happened. I said, well, that's a good story. He goes, no, no, no. Yeah. He says he heard it. <laughs> so I don't. Well, you know, Terry was a little bit further along in his career, so he was a veteran guy, and he was a little bit Savvy. more in tune with things. So I'm not going to doubt him. Uh, teammates, just quick. The, how conscious were you of being a good – we'll talk about 95 in one second. How conscious were you of what a good teammate is? Conversely, what a good teammate or what a, what a bad teammate is. Let's, you, you figure out what a good one is. Do you figure out what a bad one is pretty quickly in the pros? I mean, I think so. You know, I mean, and, and listen, it's not – good teammates, bad teammates are, is, is not predica- predicated on everybody gets along, mm-hmm. right? Because that, that whole notion that everybody on the roster loves one another is just not true, right. you know? Now, it's not what the old Red Sox used to be was 25 guys, 25 cabs. It wasn't anything like that, but – you know, it, it, it. We, I think, we were really good at when it came time to go on the field. We got each other's back. Okay. You know, all 25 guys respect what we're doing. And we're all going in the same direction. Off the field, look, we all had our we all had our clicks. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. starting pitchers tend to hang together. Hitters hang together. Relievers hang together. Mm-hmm. That's who you're spending the most time with. That's who you get to know. Um, but I think more than anything else, to me, you know, the good teammates obviously were a guy to me. And this is just how I'm wired. First and foremost, you got to be a rule follower. If you're supposed to be at the ballpark at a certain time, then get to the ballpark. You know, if you're supposed to be out on the field for BP, then get your ass out on the field for BP. Dress you know, the way. Dress the way you still, you know, which were all Bobby's rules. But, you know, you you can't have somebody thinking that everybody else has to do that, but I don't. Right. Right. So that's now you're going to have times mm-hmm. where, you know, a guy's hurt and he's got to get treatment. He's not going out for batting practice, obviously. Or, you know, a guy had something going on. He's going to be a little bit late to the ballpark. I mean, those things happen, but it's not every single day. Um, the other thing that used to drive me crazy was I would watch guys that would sit there in front of their locker waiting to be interviewed when they had a good game. 
And when they had a bad game, they're nowhere to be found. Yeah. You know, and it's like, dude, if that's how if that's who you are, then you really don't have a whole lot of of care about what this team is doing because win or lose, it's all predicated on how many hits you got. Right? That's what drives your boat. I didn't like those guys. You know, now again, there were certain guys that would come along that didn't quite fit the narrative. But, and, but they weren't here very long. They weren't, I was going to say, they were yeah. never here very long. Yeah. And by the way, that, that red light guy, you find it out pretty oh, quickly. Very, very quickly. Yeah. Or the guys who were playing for the first and the right. 15th. It's a good, no, it's a good yeah. job. But there were. Yeah. I mean, because there were times where not, maybe not, not necessarily here. There was a time or two when I, took a vacation went and went somewhere else yeah you went north where yeah you'd see a lot of guys hide and then you know i'd be sitting there answering questions in a game that i didn't even play in i'm like oh, it's funny you what am that. i doing here i remember going up and billy wagner had to tell people get away from david Wright. yeah you guys are bombing this guy he had yeah. nothing to do with this tonight yeah but there were other yeah. weren't other people sitting at nobody the there yeah all right you gotta well, be accountable uh, before we do a quick q a 1995 do you actually get a car for winning the World Series MVP in 1995? No, I didn't. I didn't even get a trip to Disney. Nothing. Nothing. I just have a trophy that I still look at. The MVP trophy? Yes. Yeah. Oh, there is a trophy. There is a trophy. Yeah, that's a nice one. Do they give you a World Series trophy? We have a replica, yeah. A replica. You yes. get a, yes. a mini. Yep. Now watch this. This is the only thing pitchers really care about. All this other stuff has been bullshit up to now. Uh, how important was it for you to be a good hitting pitcher, and how many silver sluggers did you win? It was very important for me, and I won <laughs> four. So next time you see Smoltzy, remind him of how many I have. How many does he have? He's got one, I think. One. Yeah. What but, about Maddox? Know, he'll give you this song and dance about, I had more power than him. It's like, John, that's not. But no, you know, that, and that's what drove me crazy. And, and I finally came around to today's game where I acquiesced on the designated hitter in the National League. Why? Because I got so tired of watching the pitchers hit. It's so as bad. A, as a guy watching so the game. So bad. Okay. And to me, there was no excuse for it. Okay. Now, I'll cut these guys in today's game a little bit of slack in the sense that, again, different environment. Mm -hmm. When I played high school, but when I played, when I played in the big leagues, I want to say there was one guy in all my years, Mark Grant, mm -hmm. who in high school didn't play shortstop or hit fourth in his lineup. Like, he was the only guy. Everybody else I played with, Athlete. Pete Smith, Avery, yeah. Smoltzy, every one of them played shortstop, hit third or fourth in their lineup, and was like the athlete on the team. Mm -hmm. These guys today... This is what you do. It's pitcher only. You walk to the mound. Right? And I fought that for so long with yeah. my son, Peyton, and it, it just drives me crazy. So now the notion that... These guys are never going to hit, right. and then they're going to learn how to do it at the big leagues. Not going to happen. Good luck with that. Yeah. Right. But that was always my thing was, and and thank God we had the coaches that worked on it, particularly Jimmy Williams. Mm -hmm. Like it, it's hard, it's hard for pitchers to get the reps and do all that stuff because it's hard to get coaches to throw BP. They're throwing BP to for a thousand guys. hours to the guys in the lineup, so it's it's not an easy deal for them to then throw to us. But Jimmy Williams was fantastic. He would every single one of us would be down in the cage after batting practice was over, before the game was going to start. He'd take two starting pitchers, twice in between your starts. You'd hit for twenty minutes. You'd bunt. You'd do all that stuff. But I just you know it, to me it was a mindset that I, you know I always said again, I'm going to give Bobby enough reasons to take me out of the game because of my pitching. I am not letting him take me out of a game because I can't lay down a bunk. Sixth inning, you can't get down a bunk. No bar, chance. So I have to think, right? <laughs> not happening. Yeah, well, it's, and that's how you get to three and five wins. So now after the Silver Slugger thing, who took you the deepest that if you think about it now, you, you, even you got to go, wow. I mean, do you I have had, one? I had two. Two. Um, Joe Carter in the World Series, uh, 92, and uh, Jack Clark in Fulton County Stadium. Now, did they watch... Or did you watch? No, they didn't yeah, watch. I watched. The you did. I watched. Did you, amazed? Yeah. But, did especially wow? the Jack Clark one I watched because <laughs> there was in Fulton County Stadium, there was a chance it was gonna hit it was gonna get in the upper deck, which was a long way in that ballpark. So I kinda had to <laughs> had to admire that one. I was like like oh my god, how far is this gonna go? If you're gonna get so, gotten, get gotten. Yeah. So but ja you know, Joe Carter was the World Series, he broke up my yeah. shutout in game one, so it was a little bit easier to take but you know funny story a, a friend of mine um who has since uh since passed away 
he would always remind me, even when I was doing games, I'd be doing a broadcast and somebody would hit a home run. I'd say, you know, you know, hit that ball a long way. And it was like clockwork. I'd get a text. Not as far as Joe Carter did. <laughs> and that's how you stay humble with 300 wins in a Hall of Fame career. All right. Um, Q&A. Questions? Anybody? Yeah. Okay. What was the conversation like after the eighth inning of game six and the one hit? I did not. Uh, as much as it pains me to say that, no. Um, you do know that it's many years later. You can change the whole story. I know I could. Um, but this again, was, it's, it's big. it was the bigger picture. It was more about us winning than it was about me being the guy out there. Um, it was a situation where, you know, at that stage of our careers, we had a great relationship with Bobby, right? And when you were pitching, if Bobby asked you how you were doing, you better give him an honest answer. And that that took time for him to gain that trust in us, right? And so, like even we knew, like if you watched Bobby, if he if he jumped up out of the mound and he was walking to the to the to the mound, you're done. He's taking you out. If he jogged out, it's like okay, I got a chance because he's coming out now to ask you. How are you? How you doing? Whatever, right? And and you have to be honest with him, right? I know there are a number of times where I, you know, he'd come out to me and I'd say, he'd say, how do you feel? I'd say, Bobby, I'm good. Just give me one more hitter. Let me get, let me give me this one more guy. And if I don't get him, I'm done, right? If you come in after an inning, he asks you how you feel, Bobby, I'm great. Everything's good. Or hey, Bobby, I'm good. I'm getting to the end of my rope. Have somebody ready. So if I get in any trouble next inning, have somebody ready to go. Don't wait for me to get in trouble. Have somebody ready. So he trusted all that. So I, you know, I knew in that game, obviously I was sharp as a tack. I was on my game. We had a long inning in the seventh inning. I forget exactly. I, was, I watched the game recently, and then I was like, oh, that what ha that's what happened. I think there was a pitching change or two, and we were threatening but didn't end up scoring. So it was the longest stint that I had sitting on the bench in between, in between my, my warm-ups. When I went out and threw my warm-ups in that eighth inning, it was the first time in the game where I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> that, uh, that took me a minute to get loose. That wasn't great. And the lineup, their lineup. The three outs that inning, two of them, I got lucky. Jim Tomey hit a deep fly ball to left center field that I thought was gone. And then there was another fly ball that was hit that I thought had a chance. So it was the first time in the game where I kind of felt like I got lucky, where I didn't really execute my pitches. So when I went into Bobby, he asked me, I was like, I was like Skip, I just got pretty lucky that inning. I said, I think I'm done. So that was it. Thank you for sharing your time. With us. Of course. Thanks for being here. Thanks to 6A and first try right. for having us. So you were a big, you were a huge part, integral part of this, you know, planting the seeds for this sustained success of the Braves. I didn't realize they were on the verge of potentially kind of a French revolution. And here we are, you know, 25, 30 years later, and they're one of the best run of the organization in all the world. In your opinion, what culturally or organizationally sets them apart to, to allow them. Uh, you know I think I think first and foremost it's it's their philosophy philosophy of how they want to do things right and and part of it is how they want to do it and part of it is how they have to do it right like we we're, were just talking about this mm -hmm. a minute ago as it relates to the Yankees right I think when you're a team a big market team that has money you draft guys, you develop guys, but inevitably it's those draft, those developing guys who are really high on your list. Those are the guys you tend to deal with as a big market team that has money when you're on the cusp of winning or you want to continue winning. So you'll deal from that pool and then you figure you can get somebody through free agency or, or whatever and, and, and make up for that, right? When you're a small smaller market team, not that the Braves are a small market team, but they can't spend like the Yankees do. They better get their draft picks right. And then they develop their guys. Guy and player. Guy and, yeah. yeah. Yes. Human being and players. Yes. You got to get it right. But then the key, I think, for them is, and you've seen it, you know, as again, we were talking about, you look at the Matt Olson trade, you look at the Sean Murphy trade. We gave up nothing for those guys, right? We gave up guys that I think this organization, this is where they do a really good job. They develop guys and then they have their tier of guys, say tier A. These are guys that we do not want to deal. 
if we have a deal that is absolutely going to knock our socks off, maybe we'll take one of these guys, but we do not want to move any of these guys. Now we have this next group of guys. They're good players, but we need to make other organizations see something in them that we don't. And we need to sell these guys to other organizations to deal from this group of guys. And I think the Braves have done a really good job of being able to do that. And again, you look at the, the Olsen trade and the Murphy trade, you know, they dealt guys that I think were highly regarded by other organizations, but more highly regarded than the Braves because they knew who else they had and they knew what their other pieces were. So they've done a good job at that. And, and you know, I think they – They've always been an organization, which I say is, has always been key, too, is you want to, as a young player, you want to be in an organization that you think your organization is going to give you the chance to get to the big leagues, right? You know that if you're in this organization and you do your job and you progress and you jump classifications and you keep going, you will, you're going to get a chance to play in the big leagues on this team. It's not the case with a lot of teams. You know, a lot of teams, it's, you know, they're reluctant to give their young guys an opportunity or they trade their guys away kind of thing. Braves have never been that organization. You know, they've always, even when I was playing, you know, that was always one of the things we used to push back on is because teams, you know, people, journalists would say, oh, how hard is it for Bobby and Leo? It's the same team every year and you just, no, it isn't. No. You look at our lineup from year to year, we always had somebody new. You know, we always had a, you know, we had a Javi Lopez and Ryan Klesko. We had a Chipper Jones and, and some, you know, we always had at least one young kid mm -hmm. that was an everyday player yep. in our lineup and sometimes two. And there was always a young guy somewhere in the mix in the rotation or in the bullpen. So I think they do a, a really good job of drafting the right people, both character-wise, talent-wise, obviously developing those guys. And then they've created a winning culture to where you see a lot of these young guys signing contracts that are – that are team friendly quite honestly if these guys you know, a lot of these guys pan out and do what they want to do they're gonna they're gonna leave some money on the table but it's that opportunity to win year in and year out and have some security that that changes the landscape for guys and i know when again when i was here going through it we had free agents come here for less money because they wanted a chance right. to go to the playoffs every year and a lot of that was front of the uniform yep. and bobby yeah 100 percent. yeah yep yeah, with, team, with teams like the Yankees, how, when, they, when they assemble their team and spend all that money, how can they not be good at this team? <laughs> well, in fairness to this current Yankees team, um, I, I heard it, I think I heard it last night on the radio as I was driving back here. I think Joe said it last night. They have, they have put more guys on the IL this year than anybody in baseball, by far. So, I mean, you look at any team. You take the equivalent of Aaron Judge out of the Braves lineup, what are they going to do? You take the equivalent of Giancarlo Stanton, who's essentially playing on one leg. You know, look, look at Ronald, right? We all talk about Ronald and what a great year he's having compared to last year. Well, one essentially leg. last year he played on one leg, right? Well, look, at, what, look at how he is now. Donaldson. Donaldson. Rizzo. Yep. I yeah. mean – so it, you know, and their pitching staff's been decimated. I don't even know who these guys are. Like, if you looked at the Yankees in spring training, probably a, a, a key part of their team was going to be their rotation and certainly their bullpen. And their their rotation, I don't even, you know, aside from Severino, who I know, and I don't know who that Severino is that pitched the other night. He's just had a god awful year. Just, you know, it just goes. And the Braves are no different in the sense. And, and and I always felt like the teams I played on here that had high expectations were no different in the sense that you're always one injury away from everything changing. Yeah. And fortunately for so many years on the teams I was a part of, we avoided the injury bug pretty good. You know, the one year that we didn't do so good, I think in 99 – uh, somehow we find our way to the World Series and, and ended up getting swept, but I don't even know how we got there. 
I mean, because we had so many guys hurt, and that lineup was just like. It wasn't your team. No. Yeah. What is your relationship like with guys like Spencer Strider and Max Reed and the other young pitchers and what kind of advice? Virtually none. <laughs> um, it's a different dynamic now, you know, um, and I get it to a certain extent. I mean, you know, Max Freed talks to me a lot when I'm down there, um, but I think he's that that's his personality. Like if yeah. if. If a butterfly walked by and Matt and, and Max thought he wanted to have a conversation, he'd be talking to him. That's just how Matt it, Mac, Max is. He, he loves to talk. So, you know, he's one of those guys that, you know, you almost say, be careful. If, if you want to ask him how he's doing, you better you better be ready for an answer because you're going to get one. Um, and that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. I think a lot of the other guys are probably more similar to what I was like in that they're quiet and they keep to themselves. And I know for me, when I was, you know, a younger player, if, if Warren Spahn or Hank Aaron came in the clubhouse, you know, I was kind of like, oh, my God. You know, and you hope they come over to you and say something and talk to you and and you know a lot of times they did and that would then you'd have a conversation but it's a little bit different at least for me i see a little bit different dynamic in today's game and i'm not saying it's good or bad but i felt like when i was a player it was much more of an open door so to speak when it came to the locker room you know if a warren spawn or hank aaron came in have at it come in yeah. Nowadays, I feel like there's a little bit more of a, that's their space. Can I? Our, our space used to be all capital letters. Yeah. Our space. Guys who formerly played. Yeah. Our space is now small letters. And it's not a bad thing, but yeah. it's their it's yeah. their space. Yeah. It's a much smaller world. Right. So my, so my point being, I don't, I don't think it's a case where I could take it upon myself and say, oh, well, just go in there and talk to them. Because it's, it's that... That locker room space, at yeah. least in my mind, I could be wrong. The way I perceive it, that space is a much more protected space than it was when I was a player. Well, and I'll just say as a guy who's 30 years, when I would see you after a game or have a beer, and our world is you don't pull up, a, you don't sit down at a guy's locker when you're going to talk to him unless somebody says pull up a chair. And I was very mindful of that. John Smoltz was the first guy who told me, you can say whatever you want, but you better show up the next day. Yeah. Really mindful of that. But you don't sit down unless you're invited to sit down. But the idea of having a beer with a guy no. post-game is no. never going to happen again. No. Like people ask, what's the biggest change you've seen? I said, oh, the baseball conversations start a pre-game, but they actually went after game where you would sit and have a beer and have a guy, a player, tell you to pull up a chair. There's not a lot of players saying pull up a chair these days because some of it's, it's a gotcha world. If you don't know guys as well, they're a little bit nervous about it. The camera phones have changed everything. Uh, everybody's got a blog or a yeah. something. So you do have to be more mindful yeah. and that's where, you sit and, down and, with. And I feel bad because I do think it's a lost art, so to speak. But that's where I learned so much about how to play the game and how to think as a pitcher. Mm-hmm. Would be, you know, in those old days at Fulton County Stadium... You know, the game would be over, people are gone, and we've got a picnic table full of guys sitting down yep. drinking a beer. And I'd be sitting there with Ted Simmons, Bruce Suter, you know, guys who have had some success talking about pitching and how to sequence guys and what do you do when a guy's looking for this pitch. How do you, you know, that that stuff is in value. I mean, it, it's unbelievably valuable how having those conversations. And I feel like... Uh, a lot of that is gone. Well, there's today. no PhD class anymore. You know, those are master classes. Yeah. Those yeah. are PhD classes. And a lot of times, guys, for whatever reason, yeah. they're gone before class is ever going to be in session yeah. ever again. Yeah. All right. We're good? Actually, interesting question. We were watching the broadcast on Saturday night, and John Smoltz was talking about nutrition and how so many of the pitchers now are so tuned in nutrition that their body fat is so low. I think I think there is truth in guys being in too good a shape. I absolutely believe that. Like Terry Pendleton used to joke, because, you know, Terry was roly-poly, right? But he would always joke, well, you can't pull fat, you know? And I was like, well, yeah, there's some truth in that, you know? Greg Maddox had yeah. maybe, I don't want to say Listen it. to me, here, Greg Maddox, okay? One of my first times, so when he came here, he moved into my neighborhood. So we would carpool a lot. And and one of the first times I carpooled to the field with him, he's pitching. He pulls into Burger King, gets a double waffle with cheese, fries, and a Coke. And I'm like, what are you doing? 
<laughs> you know, and like in classic Greg fashion, he's like, what? <laughs> well, you know, and then he goes out and he deals. So we didn't, we didn't pay attention to, to nutrition. He might have had the worst body. Oh my God! Body to Hall of Fame resume. Yeah. he might if have. There was a ratio. He might it, have. He might have had the worst yeah. body I've ever seen. I mean, it, we didn't pay attention. And and look, I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing. I mean, I, I think you, you you just learn, right? It's like, my God, how did we all survive getting but, in a car without putting on a seatbelt? But how many but, times were you know, on a disabled list? Tell everybody. I was never on the. I'm, never. My last year when never. I was 42 years old and right. I pulled a hamstring, but. You know, I, I do think there there is some there is some truth to guys being too tightly wound. No question about it. I mean, you got to have a little you got to have a little bit of fat on you. You got to have a you know. To me, the the leaner you are, the more ripped you are, so to speak. Particularly for a baseball player, where so much of what we do is fast twitch muscles you got to have some flexibility and you start to lose that flexibility as a baseball player i think you're you're getting in trouble so i think i think there's i think there's some truth in that yeah. i think there's a balance and i think it's gone too far the other way to where guys are way too conscious well, about I live as a radio host believing the same thing. I mean, <laughs> you might, I don't want to hurt myself either. Exactly. I'll just keep on an extra 16, yes. 17 pounds and yeah. I'm all good to go. All right. I think we're good. Um, Any more? You got one more? Go ahead. Can you Yes. Yeah. No, you, you grab that big league ball, and it's like, oh, my God, where are the seams? You know? <laughs> it's like, how are you going to make this ball do anything? But, you, you know, I mean, you'll learn how to do it. I mean, it's, it is it's it is it is an odd thing that you don't play with the same ball in the minor leagues yeah. that you do when you get to the big league. And you but, can't move any. Like, you guys no, used you to can't. be able to push a seam Well, up. and that's where, you know, when everybody talks about the juice ball, um, we might be seeing it again this year yeah. a little bit. Um, but there is some, there's some truth in that. Mm -hmm. You know, I know for me, one or two of the years where they talked about the ball being juiced, you know, you would typically you get a baseball, you know, they've been rubbed up, you get it. And inevitably, I don't care how well it was rubbed up by the umpire. You're still going to do something to it. You're mm -hmm. going to spit on it, rub some dirt, get your own little feel on it. And and usually you can rub it and you'll stick your fingernail in there right. and see see what the leather does. And usually on a normal baseball, you can stick your fingernail in there and you're going to get a little indentation in the leather. Well, in some of those juice ball years, you'd get a ball and you'd and nothing. I mean that leather had no give. It was like a golf ball, and as, you know you throw that one away. <laughs> Give me another one. See if I can find one that has a little bit of play in it. So there, there's definitely something to the whole juice ball theory and how the balls are wound, 100%. The last question I have is, years ago, I made a comment about the Baseball Association and the Baseball Association and the Baseball Association. He's out of there now. So he, yeah, he, um, he got out was a free agent signing by the Nationals. Uh, so he played last year in A ball, Fredericksburg, had a really good year. Um, this year he started the year, was not great in spring training physically, started the year, shoulder didn't feel good, did rehab, and sadly just had surgery three weeks ago. So hopefully that's – he's on the path to recovery So because he, he had some stuff going on. So hopefully that's going to be a good thing in the long run. All right. Thank you, sir. Pleasure. It's been too long. I know. Yeah. And by the way, I will say this, and I wouldn't say, you know, I would say it if he wasn't here. Family has always been really important to him. I've always been very, very impressed with how he's handled that part of his life as well. So for whatever that's worth, and I do know that sometimes we don't talk about it, 95% of the guys are doing the right thing. 5% of don't grab all the headlines. And it's nice to know that I've been around and been afforded the opportunity to be around people who absolutely have priorities in order, n no matter what it is you're doing on a baseball field, a football field, or someplace else. Appreciate so it. So congratulations you. on Thank that, you. too.